Hi, welcome. It is the end of the first full week of 2025, and I'm going to do something I've done for most of the last four decades. I spend the first week of each year collecting data on publicly traded companies and analyzing them, coming up with statistics. I don't do it for you, I do it for myself because I need this data for the rest of the year in my valuation and corporate finance analyses. As I go through this session, though, I want to use it to describe the sample this year, what it looks like relative to previous years, and also spend a little time talking about the processes I go through to come up with the statistics you might see on my webpage. I will also add some caveats on what you can and cannot do with the data. Let's start by looking at the arguments for using data. I find data to be the best way to counter assertions. Now in corporate finance and investing, I'm shocked by people making statements that I do a double take on and say, really, is that true? Are companies more indebted than they ever used to be? Do US companies pay less in taxes than companies elsewhere? The only way to answer those questions is by looking at the data. And I think that the data that you see on my webpage can equip you with the tools to kind of, you know, at least confront some of these assertions. Second, the expert class has acquired a bad reputation, especially in the last few years, partly because experts in every discipline make predictions without telling the world about the uncertainty they feel about those predictions. I don't know why. I think they might feel that if showing people that your predictions are uncertain is a sign of weakness, but to me it's a sign of strength. So as you look at my data, I will be quite clear that the data is not going to give you precise answers. It's going to give you uncertain answers. So as you look at the data, take a look at how much variation there is in the data, because that's going to be a factor in how precise your predictions are going to be. So that's a draw of data. You can counter assertions and you can estimate how much noise there is in your predictions. That said, though, there are dangers in data. There is this belief somehow that's been in, in, enshrined and people seem to buy into it. That if you use data, you're being objective. You're not being biased. As someone who's worked with a lot of data, I can tell you that in the hands of somebody who has strong biases and preconceptions, you can make the data sing any tune you want it to sing. I'll give you an example. Now, uh, I compute tax rates for, you, uh, for companies around the world, and I report average tax rates by industry and for the entire market. Now, you've heard the statement that U.S. companies don't pay their fair share in taxes. Let's see if this is true. In 2024, for instance, I computed tax rates for U.S. companies. You're saying, why plural? Why not one number? Because it depends on how the number is computed. The first way I computed the tax rate for U.S. companies is I computed the tax rate for each U.S. company, and I took the simple average. That's what you see to the left, an average effective tax rate. Why is it so low? Because lots of companies are money losing companies. They pay no taxes and when I bring them into the sample, it pushes down my tax rate. In fact, if I look at the average tax rate across just money making companies, the number jumps to about 20%. There's a big jump when you bring in the fact that only those companies that have taxable income will pay taxes. The problem though is when you use simple averages, small companies and large companies both weight in exactly the same way. You could, uh, so I also compute an aggregated number. What does that mean? I add up the taxes that all companies in the universe pay and I divide by the total taxable income. In effect, it's a weighted average tax rate with the weights are based on how much income each company makes. Those tax rates are all the effective tax rates. What are effective tax rates? They're the tax rates you see in the income statement, but taking the taxes paid and taxable income, which are both accrual numbers. As opposed to what? As opposed to the actual cash taxes paid. So I've also computed average cash tax rates for money-making companies and an aggregated cash tax rate, right? Take the cash taxes paid by all companies and divide by the total taxable income. And those numbers start to come up between 23, 24, 25%. Now, the reason I bring this up is I know my tax rates are used by advocates on both sides. For those who want to argue that U.S. companies don't pay their fair share in taxes, they latch on to the 6% that you see that I report as the average tax rate. For those people who argue that U.S. companies pay more of, of, or a fair amount in taxes, they latch on to the higher numbers. I can't control what people use, but buy a beware. So when you see somebody talking about tax rates, you might want to check out the range of tax rates depending on how they're estimated. 
Now, the danger of data, of course, also is that people often use data as a predictor of the future. They assume that history repeats itself. This is called mean reversion. You assume that things will revert back to the average. Now, don't get me wrong. Mean reversion is a very powerful force, and much of active investing is built on mean reversion. In what way? When you buy low PE stocks, you know why you make money? Because low PEs converge towards the average PE for a sector. Much of active investing is built on a belief in mean reversion. I've written before about the dangers of assuming mean reversion. If that's the only at the core of your strategy, you are risking the possibility that you might not revert back to the mean or the mean you revert back might not look like the mean from the past. For the last decade, you had people avoiding US stocks based on average PE ratios of the market being higher than they've been historically. So as you look at my data, whether it's data on PE ratios for US companies over time or PE ratios across the sector, and you look at the averages, use the averages, but be careful about not assuming that things will revert back to those averages. So with that lead, and let me talk a little bit about the sample this year. I am very cautious about removing companies from my sample because that's how bias starts. So I don't want to focus just on large companies or just on companies that have lots of information on them. So I use information on all publicly traded companies, small or large, anywhere in the world. I use lots of different data services for my raw data, and I am thankful for the fact that I live in a time when that raw data is easily accessible. For my individual company data, I use S&P's Capital IQ, I use Bloomberg Terminals, and I'm lucky because I have access to that data through, my, through the fact that I work at NYU. For my macroeconomic data, my primary source of data is FRED. This FRED St. Louis data set, absolutely amazing data of our macroeconomic variables. For bond default spreads, I use NAICS, which actually does a very helpful monthly summary of what the default spreads are for different ratings classes. And for country risk scores, I use a service called Political Risk Services to get my data. But more on that when I get to that data, but that's where I get the raw data. So the start of 2025, I look for any company, any publicly traded company, the market cap greater than zero, and my total sample at 47,810 companies. This gives you a breakdown on the basis of market cap of where those companies are, as well as in terms of pure numbers. In terms of pure numbers, if you look at Asia without Japan, China, and India, you get 10,176 companies. That's my biggest single sub-region. But in terms of market cap, it's, it's, it's no contest. U.S. companies are about 49% of the market cap of all global companies. Now, if you've been tracking this number over time, as I have, one of the things you can see is the rise of US, the U.S. in terms of overall market cap globally. In, at the start of 2023, the U.S. was about 42% of overall market cap, global market cap. At the start of 2024, it's about 44%. start of 2025, it's about 49%. If you see the drop-off, China has seen a drop-off from about 16% down to 12.6%. India has seen a rise from 358 to 4.19%. And Europe has dropped off as well. Now, maybe there will be a mean reversion here as well as U.S. companies take a step back. But the rise of U.S. equities over the last 20 years has been significant in terms of market cap. Now, if you break the companies down by sector, and I'm using the S&P sector categorization, Again, the largest number of companies is in the industrial sector, 8,780 companies. But in terms of market cap, it's, it's technology companies that have the largest market cap, accounting for 21% of the market cap of all companies globally. Now, if you look across the world, though, it's uneven. So if you look at the sectors and, and how much they account for market cap around the world, the U.S. technology is almost 30% of the market cap. In fact, much of the rise you saw in total market cap of U.S. companies comes from the rise of technology. If you look at Europe, technology is less than 8%. In fact, Europe has the lowest percentage of technology companies in terms of market cap, which I think is a significant weakness for Europe because that's where the growth is coming from and you don't have a foothold from that growth. You're not going to be able to grow with the rest of the world. If you look at financial services, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, financials account for about 30% of overall market cap, but in the US are only about 14.5%. So the sector breakdown is useful in terms of thinking about where these companies get their value. 
Now I actually take those sectors, which are, which are really broad, and I break them down into 94 industry groups. I could take you through the history of these industry groups, but they originated almost 40 years ago when I first started looking at data from Value Line, which used to do it for just US companies. My industry classifications stay close to that original classification. And I know it cuts against the conventional practice. Many investment banks and data services do use SIC codes or NICS codes, but my classification works for me. I want my classification to be broad enough that I get enough companies within each group and narrow enough that I get the characteristics of a business. So it works for much of what I do in corporate finance and valuation. Of course, your needs might be different. You might want a much more refined grouping of companies, maybe just luxury retail, in which case you probably need access to a raw data service, but unfortunately my categorization has to stand based on what I have. So as you look at the data, check out both the industry group and the region your company falls in because I report the averages by industry and by region. And I've broken my companies down to five regions, the US, Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and what I call emerging markets, which is really the bulk of my sample, 26,000 companies. Within emerging markets, I do sub markets for India and China. So all in all, I have you know the, the, the groupings, the five groupings I have, plus the two country, industry, India and China, as well as a global average that I report for almost every statistic I compute. In terms of the data, I teach two classes, corporate finance and valuation. My data reflects how I think about data within each of these classes. In corporate finance, there are three basic decisions businesses have to make, the investment decision, the financing decision, and the dividend decision. My data is basically, you know, follows those principles. For the investment principle, I, you know, collect data to come up with hurdle rates and how to measure returns, accounting returns on equity, returns on capital, profit or burden margins, profit margins. For the financing principle, I look at both mix of debt and equity across companies, as well as the type of debt. And for the dividend principle, I track dividends paid as well as stock buybacks, as well as what companies could have paid out as free cash flow equity. On the corporate governance dimension, I do track insider institutional holdings. I also track, you know, operating numbers and employee count, at least to help you in making that assessment. Now, much of what I collect as data for corporate finance finds its way into my valuation class as well. But I do have other data that I collect specifically for valuation. These include growth numbers, both historical, fundamental, and predicted growth, reinvestment and return on capital numbers. I also have risk and, uh, uh, risk and profitability numbers that you might use in your valuation. I also track pricing ratios, price earnings ratios, price to book, price to sales, peg ratio, you name the multiple, I track them across industries and across regions. So a lot of data there, but you can pick and choose what you want out of the data. Now, in terms of timing, I want to be very clear about what I have available to me to, to compute my averages at the start of 2025. For market data, I obviously have data which is current as of the end of 2025 market cap on December 31st, interest rates on, 2020, on December 31st, risk premiums on December 31st. But for accounting data, I'm restricted to what accounting data was available at the start of 2025. And because accounting data doesn't get updated every day, every week, or even every month, for many of my companies, the most recent accounting data is as of the end of September of 2024. So when I use income state, income revenue, income statement numbers, I use the trading 12 months through September 30th of 2024. When I use balance sheet numbers, they will be as of the most recent balance sheet as of September 30th of 2024. Now you may view that as inconsistent, but to me that reflects in entirely consistent views of data. The way I think about data is I have to use the most updated number I can find for every single input. And for accounting numbers, that'll actually lag the market numbers in terms of when they get updated. Now, as you use my data through the course of 2025, the accounting data will age pretty well. So things like returns and capital return equity will not change dramatically. The numbers that might change significantly are the pricing numbers, the multiples that I compute, the PE, the price to book, EV to EBITDA. So we're in November of 2025, and it's been a very active year, either up or down for the market. 
you might want to reassess what those numbers look like. For some of the data, I give you a chance to update the data. For instance, I have a cost of capital worksheet where I report cost of capital by industry group. I allowed you to update the T-bond rate and the equity risk premium to get more updated numbers. So that's data timing in the data DK. Now in terms of the estimation process itself, when I first started, I used to compute simple averages of pretty much every metric. Then I realized a couple of things. One is, when numbers were not available, the averages got biased because I was throwing out companies. And second, you had small companies, large companies, big numbers, small numbers, outliers, all pulling the average. So I've wrestled with how best to report industry averages. And the best estimate I can think of for almost every single you know, metric is to compute an aggregated number. So what does that mean? To compute the return in equity for steel companies. I add up the net income for every steel company, including money losing steel companies. I add up the book equity for every steel company, including money losing steel companies. And I divide the aggregated net income by the aggregated book equity. Now, there are other ways you can get around the problem of outliers and missing data, but to me, this is the simplest way to do it. And now I don't like to throw out data that's missing, so I try to, or that's negative. So basically, I try to keep my sample intact as I go through the process. They say, what about the fact that there are accounting differences and currency differences? The currency differences are easy. I do everything in US dollar terms. My raw data service actually provides data in US dollars, so I'm not comparing apples and oranges. The accounting differences have narrowed over time. I won't claim that every country has the same accounting standards. But IFRS and GAAP have converged and the rest of the world is moving towards it. So I have an easier time now than I did 30 years ago in computing these averages. Now as to how you can access the data, the best way to do it is probably go on my webpage, click on data, and then click on current data. The link is down here, but you can just go through my webpage. You will see the current data and all of the items I talked about will be there. You'll see an HTML link where you can see it as a webpage for US companies. And then you'll see spreadsheets for each region separately, which are Excel spreadsheets. I would strongly recommend downloading the Excel spreadsheets for two reasons. One is within each, each Excel spreadsheet, I have, a, I have a worksheet where I describe each data item in that spreadsheet. So if you want to know how I compute net margin, it should be in that worksheet. And second, in many of these uh, spreadsheets, I've put in a little video on how best to use the data in that web page. If you're interested in historical data from previous years, I do have archived data. It's not the easiest archived data to work with, but you can click through 2023, 2022. Some of the data goes back 20 plus years, some goes back 10 years. But if you're interested in the archived data, that too is available off my webpage. Now, finally, I put this data out because I want people to use it. And I, it's designed primarily for practitioners, people doing valuation of corporate finance on a daily basis. It's not designed for academic research, so you can use it if you're, you're welcome to try, but it's not that you user-friendly for that, for that basis. I've also changed data services over time, so the return equity you might get in 2020, 2024 might not be comparable to the return equity in, in 2004. It is not a research database, but you're welcome to use it as such if you feel the urge. If you do use my data, and I hope you do, you don't have to, you know, you, you can acknowledge that you got it from my webpage, but if you don't, I won't take it as a personal slide. I definitely won't threaten you with legal consequences. No. As a final note though, you know, in case you feel inclined to send an email to the team that works for me on something that needs to be fixed, there's a team of one, it's just me. You know, so I, you know, and I am not the Pope. I am eminently fallible. I make all kinds of mistakes. So what I'm trying to say is if you do run into a mistake in the data and there are hundreds of data sets there and I'm sure I made a mistake, let me know and I'll fix it. You know? If, you know, the, the one additional thing I want to add on is if you feel a need for customized data, I'm not a data service. I'm unfortunately, I cannot provide you customized data for the most part. So if you want something truly customized, you might have to go to the raw data to do it on your own. And it's doable. It's much easier than it used to be. I hope you find my data useful. And I thank you very much for listening.